Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you. If you didn't know it already, uh, welcome to a membership class. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what we're going to do in here together this week and the next two weeks. I shared this with the staff and Ruth Kovacs, who's been on our staff and part of this church for years, she says, I love that. It has been so long since I remember who we were and what we were about. I want to be a part of the membership class. So that's what we're going to do for these next three weeks, or talk about some of these elements of it, all set in the context of what we discussed last week. And if you weren't with us online, you can still take a look at what we talked about Last week, as we consider the possibility that God might have for Montecito Covenant Church in this very season, an invitation into an inflection point. When things change dramatically in, 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 in different ways that the normal trajectory of where we're headed seems to move. But we have this sense that um, God is asking us to ask that question. Is it possible that um, God is in the midst of doing a new thing here? And we will decide that together, as God's people did in Ezra chapter 7 and Ezra chapter 8, as we looked at that passage of Scripture and heard that story of a group of people who gathered together, spent some time in discernment, and said, is this God's call, and what does it mean for us to step into it? And those are the questions we asked last week and just proposed, what if we take this month of November and just digest that and think through what would it look like for this to be an inflection point for our congregation? And what would it look like for us as members of that congregation for us to contribute to this being an inflection point? I can't tell you how encouraged I've been this past week actually hearing the conversations. with We had some at Samarkand and with other individuals over coffee and, and even some emails that I received along the way and some phone calls or people. There's just this sense of, yes, we, this just feels like it's true. And and people jumping in in substantial ways, as we talked about last week, that this would have to be something we would do together, and we would jump into in substantial ways, that we wouldn't just simply do church as normal. And there is a normal for church. The normal thing for people that are involved in a church is for us to be generous in many ways in many other areas, and ask the question, what about for these next two years if we're particularly generous with the, with our resources in regards to what God might call this congregation to? What would it look like for us to step it up or reconfigure in such a way based on a conviction that God may be up to something here that's unique and do beyond normal in order that we might be beyond a normal church making beyond a normal contribution to the community around us and the world around us as well? And then also for us to jump in in regards to our involvement here. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Isn't it great to connect with people and get to know people and to welcome those who are new to us to be a part of it? Normal for church, did you know that normal for uh, a regular attender in a church right now has just gone up? When I, when I first started out in ministry, a regular attender was someone who would be there three out of four Sundays a month. And now the count is, a regular tender is counted on someone who's there one out of four, even one out of six Sundays. Uh, that's considered a regular uh, attender. And that's just pretty normal. I mean, that's just simply the normal trajectory of life for us. There's a whole lot going on. The invitation I made last week was, what if we were abnormal in regards to that? What if the priority for us would be to gather together with others? So, we would see each other regularly and talk to each other regularly. Our kids would see each other regularly and talk to each other regularly. Those who come in, we would get to know them because we would see them week after week if they chose to make this a place where they wanted to worship. You know, all of what was happening in Ezra 7 and 8 was a decision God's people made to leave Babylon, and it was a sweet place to live by then. The people of God, the Jews in that time who had been exiled to Babylon actually discovered it was a really, really wonderful place to, to live. They had done well. Many, many had become wealthy. And to decide to go back to Jerusalem was regression in many ways. It was downsizing in so many ways to be able to do that. But their intention was this. God wants us to be a, a worship team. We're going to go back to Jerusalem and we're going to 
worship there because worship not only affects the room, it affects the surroundings. We talked about this imagery we see in Scripture often enough where we, God's people are like streams of water in a desert. And it's not just the, the, the wadi that's wet, it's the whole, whole terrain that flourishes as a result of it. What does it mean for us to be God's people? And that actually was that group that decided, that discerned there by the canal, yes, God is up to something and we're a part of this and we're going to make this high-risk decision to leave it all behind and to walk through terrain hostile to anybody who has any resources, robbers and uh, marauders, and going to go to Jerusalem and be people that make sure worship takes place. That was actually the worship team. That was the worship team. You know, we had Hillary and all you guys, thank you so much for being our worship team. We, we call them the worship team, but did you know you're actually the worship team? That's actually right. People who decide to journey with God are the worship team. In fact, someone might even say to you, well, what's worship like at Montecito Covenant Church? And you know what the real answer would have to be? I'll tell you in two years. Did you get it? If we decide to be the worship team, the result of that will be seen not so much on a particular Sunday morning, but what that church looks like two years from now. I just like that sense of some of this, what's worship like at Montecito Covenant Church? And that's to say, don't know yet. I'll let you know in two years. And that's what we see in Ezra and that's what our invitation is here as well. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take three sessions where those of us, like Ruth, and those of you who have been around this place for a long time, are reminded of who we are and what we're about and where God might be taking us. And this time together over these three weeks will serve as a reminder for you, and I hope an encouraging one as well, as we talk about the past and think about the future. For those of you that say, you know, I've been here, but I've never really kind of been on the worship team. I really like this place, and I'm regular to this place, but I get this sense inside of me that God might be calling me into something different. And these three weeks will essentially form the basis for joining in as a worship team member of this congregation, or member of this congregation are the words that we use. And as such, we are those who will declare our intentions to help this community to grow and to flourish and to strengthen God's good purposes for the community around us. To become a, a member of the worship team is a commitment that we make to ourselves and to you and others. It's essentially saying, I'm in. You can count on me and I will count on you. That sense of it. For those of us that grew up, you know, way, way back in the last century, there was this song it just always goes through my head signs signs everywhere a sign blocking up the scenery with something in my mind right do this don't do that can't you read the signs the sign says you got to have a membership card to get in inside followed by just a great big groan Man, i i particularly like that song you really ought to look for it put it on your playlist it's actually a really pretty cool song but it was kind of this renegade thought that i'm not going to be normal anymore and, and, and to be a member of anything, are you kidding me? So I want us to just kind of flip that on its edge and say when we're talking about being a member of a, pla a place, um, it, 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 we're just simply saying to each other we're in. Um, and you can count on us. And I want a group of people that I can count on in particular and deep and meaningful ways too. And it allows us to be those that make the decisions for where God takes this church. So are you in with me on it? And if you actually say, this is actually a formal process for me, um, next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall, or the following Sunday at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall, join us there because if you want it to be kind of an official journey that you take towards this, um, there are just a couple of other things we're going to need to talk up to with each other. So be here for these three weeks on Sunday morning and involve yourself in one of those moments on either at either 9 a.m. next Sunday or the Sunday following that. I know there's another group of people in the room that is, I'm not sure I'm ready to jump in in anything right now, but I'm here because I'm curious. 
Uh, and uh, this is an explanation of who we are and where we believe God is taking us, and you are so welcome to be here for that also. In fact, you are so welcome that uh, coming up on November 13th, Beth and I want to welcome you to our home, our parsonage, just right over there. There'll be a potluck there. We're going to just have a bunch of, oh, yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. Over there it is. So when I go home after service today, I better go the right direction. So we're going to have a potluck together. We're going to play some games together. We're going to just have some fun and a conversation with each other too. And so we would invite you to be part of that as well. Let me pray for us as we jump into this journey into worship leadership. Lord, thank you that you are on the throne and um, that you are present in this world, in this congregation, in our homes, and in our lives. God, we want to know what that means more deeply. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if we're going to tell this story, we've got to start in Sweden. Yep, that's where this whole group began. Now, growing up, the distance between my house and Sweden was as far away as the steps to my grandmother's room. Grandma lived with us. Uh, Matilda Severson, people called her Tilly, and she spoke Swedish, at least an Ufta and a Tuxkataha or whatever it is. I'm not even sure I have those rights, but that's how my grandma said it, and she was Swedish, and she told me that there would be Swedish in heaven, and so I never learned the language anyway. <laughs> but there was this sense of what it meant to be Swedish. Well, here's what I know about Swedes. They have a, a sense of humor, if you would call it that, feel a little more like dad jokes to me in contemporary vernacular, but this is it. So here's one. Why do Swedes always drink their milk in the grocery store? Because it says open here. (laughs) Here's another one. What is written on the bottom of Coke bottles in Sweden? This is my dad's favorite joke, by the way. Open other end. (laughs) See, they're kind of like dad jokes, aren't they? I've got one more if you'll just be patient with me for a moment here. There's a Swedish truck driver once got stuck in a tunnel in Norway. And soon a Norwegian came up the tunnel and found out that the truck was wedged in with the load of the truck stuck against the ceiling. And so the Norwegian remarkably decides to be helpful. Doesn't happen very often, but this one decided to be helpful. And he suggested to the Swede that he let some air out of the tires. Swede looked at the Norwegian mockingly and said to him, Ufta, don't you know the truck is stuck up on the top? (laughs) So this group of Swedes probably have the same sense of humor of any other Swede I have ever known. Swedes also had an unexplainable appreciation for loot fisk. Never tasted, I smelled it. It's all I needed to do. And then there was pickled herring. But as a compliment to that, there were these Sour cream donuts. Oh, my goodness, were they good. And then those cookies at Christmas time. And then this group of Swedes, this particular group of Swedes I want to mention to you, also had something else. They had a conviction that something called personal faith mattered. That it was somehow a personal thing. You see, they grew up in a a country where the, where Sweden actually had a state church. And so essentially, if you were born there, you were born into baptism at a church. And the state church was simply your affiliation. It's where births were celebrated, where weddings were celebrated, where funerals were held. I, one of our interns actually shared with the, the uh, Samarkand group she said, uh, I, I, my family were church CEOs, uh, Christmas and Easter only uh, people. And so that's really kind of what the state church sort of fostered, right? I mean, it was this necessary sort of a thing, and you attended when, it were, when you ought to, but there was not necessarily any real life to it, except for this group of Swedes that said, but there ought to be. There ought to be a reality to this that is a part of life. You know what they began to do? They began to get together in homes. And they called these groups conventicles. You getting the idea? Evangelical Covenant Church. No, it's not what you can and can't do with your property. It's a gathering of people in a conventicle where they, 
they did life together with the understanding that life was also spiritual. And they asked really simple, a couple of simple questions. One is, where is it written? I, I want to know what God has to say. I'm, I'm not interested in your opinion or, or your opinion even of what your, your opinion is of God. I want to know, there's, a, there's this book brought together by this gracious, kind, generous, merciful God. Um, tell me what he has to say. And they spent time talking about what, what God has to say about himself and about us and about the world we live in. And there's another question that they would ask, and it was, how goes your walk? You see, it wasn't just simply filling our head with knowledge about what God has to say. It was actually, and what difference does it make in your life this week? How's it going? What do you need to know about God? Maybe some correction, maybe some encouragement, maybe, maybe comfort, maybe hope. How goes your walk? And that's what these groups were like. This, this, this commitment to a conviction that personal faith mattered. And it was a simple faith. Respect for God's wisdom, appreciation for God's tenderness, and we'll get to that in a little while this week or next. And, and life-impacting devotion to God and God's concerns for everyone everyone perhaps you've heard this story before i was walking across a bridge one day and i saw a man standing on the edge about to jump off so i ran over and i said stop don't do it why shouldn't i he said i said well there's so much to live for and he said like what i said well are you religious or an atheist he said religious i said me too are you a christian or buddhist he said, Christian. And I said, me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. Are you Baptist or Methodist? And he said, Baptist. I said, wow, me too. Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? He said, Baptist Church of God. I said, me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God? Or are you Reformed Baptist Church of God? He said, Reformed Baptist Church of God. I said, me too. Are you Reformed Baptist Church of God Reformation 1879 or Reformed Baptist Church of God Reformation 1915? He said, Reformed Baptist Church of God Reformation 1915. And I said, die, you heretic scum, and pushed him off. <laughs> I laugh even after I've heard that story two or three times before, too. And you know what? This group of Swedes, they said, I don't want that ever to be true. It just doesn't match what's written. That's, that's not who we want to be. That group of Swedes wanted to desperately avoid this. These friends are the Swedes that formed the roots of our denomination. It was a group that resisted being a formal entity, in fact. One of the last subset groups of Swedes that ever got organized. There's got to be a good joke there somewhere. <laughs> but there was a sense of, um, we, we don't want to be anything other than God's people on mission with others. In fact, the address of the first president, when they finally realized pragmatically, they, if they were working together, they could do things together that would make a greater impact. And so, almost kicking and screaming, they decided to become a denomination. And the president of the first denomination, his first address, it's found in, in Psalm 119, verse 63. And this was the text the president pulled out. We are friends of all who fear him. Yeah, it's right there in Psalm 119. Friends of all who fear him. And the declaration of this group of Swedes was, that's who we will be. We will honor God, we will love one another, and we will care for everyone. In their earliest designation, they called themselves mission friends. Mission friends. This refusal to be defined by differences mean they, meant they never put a doctrinal statement together. They never composed one. 
In fact, in the history of the denomination, any time a doctrinal statement was demanded for a connection with another group of people, the thought was, well, thank you, but we, 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 we got two questions. Where is it written? And how goes your walk? And because doctrinal statements oftentimes are statements of, let me tell you how I'm different than you, the Swedish Covenant Church decided to arrive at a different place. Instead of saying what we do believe and what we don't believe, we're going to affirm what we believe is true as we look at Scripture. And they came up with six. Central realities upon which community would be built that would allow us with many others to travel together on mission. Now, just personally speaking, Beth and I discovered this group, and it took us a while. I, I said, I'm, I'm, I am pretty Swedish. It took me a long time for me to find the, my family. When we were invited to pastor a church in the Kansas City area, and it was a covenant church, we learned more about that group, this group, and felt like, wow, we've kind of been this way our whole life. This just fits us. No longer a bunch of Swedes in a room anymore. There are actually Norwegians there. I'm, I'm kidding about that. Although I do know a church in Omaha, Nebraska that said to me when they found out that actually my name was Norwegian, my mother, grandmother was Swedish, my grandfather was Norwegian. I mean, it, yeah, it was one of those marriages. Um, when, when, when they found out that it was actually Norwegian last name, they said to me, oh, that's too bad. But if you just take a step back and you look more broadly at when people in the covenant get together, you will see just such a rich diversity of people. Men and women of all sorts of backgrounds and ethnicities worshiping together. It really is remarkable that these Swedes became this place where said, you are so welcome. You know, in the past number of years has grown dramatically and the president of our denomination said that means we've gone from Chihuahua to Poodle. But I mean, this small group has actually been a vibrant group. And over 30% of the denomination and leadership and attendance is characterized by people of color. Uh, it's just really, it's really a rich environment to be in. It took us a long time to find that. I will tell you this, it didn't take Montecito Covenant Church very long at all. Montecito Covenant Church was started, a group of people. You could have even called it a conventicle. I mean, they were a group of people in the fall of 1959, or perhaps even before that. In they gathered together, a few people gathered together for prayer and Bible study on Wednesday evenings. In fact, it was Dr. David, David Hubbard, Mary's dad, actually, uh, who was a professor at, at Westmont at the time and then became the president of Fuller Seminary. Uh, who, who knew of this group of covenant people and just encouraged the church to consider it. So by the fall of 1959, this group of people had called a permanent minister. And in 1961, this group said, we are covenant. And this is what they said. In historic dominance, it says this, our predecessors were attracted to the covenant emphasis on being an evangelistic community that is, persuasive but never coercive, enabling but never controlling, impelling but never compelling. Amazing. You guys found it right away. And there was just a sense with those that founded this place said, we resonate with that. That is who we are. And this coming together has been brought about a rich history of Montecito Covenant Church. So where, what does that even mean? I want to spend the next couple weeks talking about what, that, what those affirmations are. And I mentioned that there were six, there are six of them, and with appreciation for historic creeds like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creeds, they're helpful as well, and embraced and read and, and memorized. There are these affirmations, and I think we can post them here. First one, we affirm the necessity of the new birth. The second one is, we affirm conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. The third one is, we affirm the centrality of the Word of God. Next one is, we affirm the church as a fellowship of, of believers. It's kind of a unity of all of us together on the same plane with one another. 
We affirm a reality of freedom in Christ. And we affirm a commitment to the whole, whole mission of the church. So I'm going to walk through that and, um, and remind ourselves of that and let those of you that are curious about what it means to be on this worship team to know what that entails. So just a little, little ways here. We affirm the necessity of the new birth. In the documents it says this, the Apostle Paul wrote, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. And that's right from our text this morning. McKenna just read it. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. This implies that as we walk towards Jesus, it is a decision to embrace starting over. An acknowledgement that we need to begin again. Motivated by a candid assessment of the here and now. There's a, there was a philosopher, a theologian, Edwin Bevan, who said this. When, when people say that they are naturally good or that our good and bad impulses are pretty evenly matched, how is it that all over the world to follow good impulses has seemed like going uphill and following the evil one has been like going downhill? You know, that was said 100 years ago. You could have said it just this week, right? I mean, just a sense of, well, we're all pretty good people. And well, then why is there so much broken? This, this candid assessment of we're in trouble and there's brokenness around us and in us. And in, fact, in fact, it was, uh, it was uh, Bono who traveled all over the world concerned about uh, global hunger. And, and his assessment, after looking at what was going on around the world in the midst of a global food crisis, he said, the problem isn't education or lack of it. The problem isn't logistics or lack of them. The problem isn't even lack of shortage of food. The problem is the human heart. That's what he said in so many words. It was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who had come recently from Russia. And we know how evil Russia is, right? Who came from Russia and spent enough time in the United States to launch this assessment. The line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. There's a little bit of what we don't like about Russia in Santa Barbara. And in my heart. And my heart needs renewal. My, my heart needs help, as does the world as does the world. It runs through every human heart. I want you to just, would you just kind of do this right here? Is it beating? Do you have a heart? That heart needs help. And the affirmation of these covenant Swedes was that the help it needs is new life in Christ. It's the author of our existence. God is the author of our existence and is the solution to our brokenness. New birth is an extension of Christ's words to Nicodemus. You remember those in John chapter 3? You must be born again, Jesus said to Nicodemus, and it created quite a stir. You know, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he was a pretty prestigious person. Outward appearances, I mean, he had everything put together. He didn't want anyone to know that he needed help too. And his words essentially to Jesus were, we, we know you have a connection with God and we want that too. And Jesus says, okay, you've got to be born again. You've got to start over, brand new life. Just a couple of things. One, Christian life is a birth. It is not something a person contributes toward. I'm going to get so good, I'm going to be a Christian someday. It's a, it's a birth. Now, I've been in three birthing rooms, three daughters. And you know what I discovered when our daughters were born? They didn't help mom at all. <laughs> Neither did I, but, but I, mean, I mean, they didn't contribute at all. I have a firm conviction that the chi a child's first words should be full sentence, thank you, mom. You know, just that sense of no contribution from the person who is given life except gratitude and appreciation. So when Jesus says, 
You need to be born again. We get a sense of what that means. No, you don't get ready for this. You don't clean up your life. You don't get particularly good at being religious. It will wear you out. You get born again. You, you, your life becomes new again. The Christian life is a birth. The Christian life is a life. It is not a rule book. It is not a membership card. It is not a ticket to heaven. It is a life. Michael and Nancy said this eloquently. It is a life that ebbs and flows. It surprises us and it challenges us. And we figure things out along the way. That's what it is, friends. It's a life. And you're in it. And you've made some mistakes along the way and you've learned some lessons along the way and you've discovered what it means to trust Jesus more along the way. Welcome to the Christian life. It ebbs and flows. There's one other element of it. The Christian life is the presence of Christ in our lives. This is what makes it so personal. It's not that our conduct is God's primary concern. Christ's death, I love the way Eugene Peterson said it, put the world square with God. So now that the, square has, the world has been put square with God, we realize that the focus of God's attention on our life is to give us newness of life. Not, not to scrutinize our life or to shame our setbacks, but to bring us into this Longing he has for you that you might live, as he says in John 10, 10, life to the full. Filled with contentment. Reminder of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 comes out this way. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Do you want that? That's newness of life. That's what it means for us to uh, be born into a life where Jesus Christ is at the center and the Holy Spirit is the power for it. This is not a list of things you're going to have to do as a Christian. This is a list of things God says He wants to do for you and me as a Christian. He wants to give it to us. So you see what these Swedes were about? They believed this was a personal thing. And they believed that it was dramatically different than anything else because Christ was in it. And they believed that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we might, in the ebbs and flows of life, experience something that feels a lot more authentically like who we were made to be than life without Christ. Now, how does that happen? Well, There's so many stories. You heard a couple this morning. I I texted a few people this week and said, tell me, tell me about your decision to follow Christ. Was it just kind of a dramatic thing? And somebody said, yeah, seven years old. I remember it vividly. I remember remember for me at least one moment in my life. I was was 17 years old. And um, I, I heard something that a pastor said from Romans chapter 12. And it said, I beg of you, therefore, that you present your body a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable form of worship. In my Bible, I have August 8th, 10.30 p.m. It was a moment. Michael has described moments in his life along the way. And Nancy, if we had a chance to hear more, that's what happens. There's just this kind of progress. Some, for some of us, it is a dramatic moment. For others, it's, you know what? I grew up in a home where God was important, and I just kept saying yes to Jesus all along the way. Here's the issue. Say yes to Jesus. And in that decision, there is newness of life. 
Now, I'm just kind of curious as we're kind of wrapping it up, and I apologize for going over, but I, I'm just kind of curious. Um, I, I would like to know more about the stories in the room. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I don't, I don't think this will put you on the spot, but our, our lives are marked by a decision to follow, to commit to Christ, to surrender to him. I wonder if you would just raise your hand and you say, you know, I, I've, been, I've been on that journey with Jesus, surrendered to him for over 20 years. Would you just raise your hand? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, that's good, isn't it? It's just that sense of, I, 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 I'm, I'm following that path. Some of you might say, don't remember how it started. I know I was, I've been in it for over 20 years. I wonder, for those of you who said, it's been more than two, but it's been less than 20. Would you just raise your hand? Yeah, that's really cool. So, some of you, it's because you're young, but that's, that's good too. And, and uh, uh, just one more here. It, 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 some, how many would say, well, it's a decision I've just made, or I'm actually in the midst of making right now, and I'm kind of wondering. I, would anybody raise their hand on that one? Here's my hope. My hope, next time we ask that, the room will be filled with those stories as we become worship leaders together. We're going to gather now around the Lord's table, the communion table, with memories of the stories of those who have been such a rich part of our life and allowing us to be here today in, in the shape we're in. Giving thanks to them, but acknowledge that at the very center of all of these stories, there is this one who gave his life out of love and compassion for us so that we might live in newness of life. This morning, it's going to be that simple. I think the Swedes might have liked it. You know what's written? What's written is that Jesus gave his life to make the world square with God so that by faith in him, we would have life in his name. And when Jesus took the bread, he broke it and he said, I want you to think about this loaf of bread in the same way you think of my body. Bread is what gives life and energy to you. That's who I am to those who follow me. And about the cup, as he, he poured the cup for the disciples that were gathered there, he says, this cup is a reminder of a promise I've made, a covenant I've made to you, that my death would make the world square with God. Only decision you need to do is how goes your life? How goes your walk? Are you walking towards Jesus? Jesus is what we need.